Robert Kennedy, and I, I'm a attorney for the Natural Resource Defense Council and president of the Waterkeeper Alliance. Dr. Dave Simone, I'm a uh, holistic dentist, I guess you consider me. I'm with the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, and uh, we did the Global Mercury Treaty on uh, mercury fillings, but uh, we tried for vaccines and worked with Eric at UNIP. Hi, I'm Maria Janik, and I'm the president of the National Autism Association for Indiana, and I run Indiana Biomedical Kids and I help recover children from environmental damage, including that from thimerosal from vaccines. Hi, I'm Shiloh Levine. I'm the co-director and one of the producers on the film, and I also uh, actually used to teach children with autism as well. Hello, I'm Eric Layden. Um, I'm uh, one of the directors. Me and Shiloh direct and produce the film, and it's been a 10-year project, and we're glad to see it come to light. So. I'm Julia Rebic. I'm the mother of an affected child, and I'm probably most well known for my writing. I write as a contributing editor at Dave Boston, helped out with a number of great organizations of Generation Rescue, and I'm helping out as a consultant for Dave's sponsor. Can you explain the protocol to safely remove a mouth of silver filling? Well, you know, it's funny. We just had a uh, toxicology meeting just a couple weeks ago, and uh, we have videos on our website, IAOMT.org, International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. And uh, funny you ask that because I actually have right here the uh, TAP program that uh, I happen to co-author a little bit on that. And basically what it is, it's the best environmental techniques and best available practices that we have to remove mercury filling safely from somebody. Obviously, you don't want particulate matter being ingested during the removal process. You've already sucked on a mercury lollipop for enough of your life. You don't need more of it. And we just finished a particulate study showing that this splatter coming off from touching a mercury filling with a drill is like an uh, atomic dust cloud for the office. So um, the key is, is to find a dentist who is uh, familiar with the academy protocols. You can go to the website, type in your zip code, and find a dentist and uh, you go through a couple interviews and make sure that person is depending on how sick you are. I see a lot of different sick patients. Some people need a lot of support protocol which we do with nutritionists and their other doctors and some people just need safe mercury removal with an oxygen mask and a dental dam. I like to protect myself, the staff, the patient and the environment. We just did some mercury sater, uh, separators University of Puerto Rico now is not dumping mercury into their water supply anymore. So 10 separators donated to the University of Puerto Rico. Can you share some of the biomedical interventions available to cover children from environmental insults? Yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I do two hours at least a, a month on uh, recovery. Basically what we start out with is a foundation nutrient program. What we found is any environmental toxicity will reduce natural nutrients in the body which are used to detoxify the body. And when you have bolus amounts of toxins, especially in a newborn baby, is those natural ingredients that you would have in the body from the mother and, um, are depleted so significantly that the body can no, no longer naturally detoxify. Um, my youngest has lead poisoning from the garden hose that many of us grew up drinking out of, um, running around playing in the yard, I drink out of the garden hose. The difference is, is I had four vaccines and he had almost 40. And we talked about the Institute of Medicine, um, their second review, page 10 said that thimerosal causes biochemical pathway problems with disordered mineral metabolism and immune system abnormalities. Well, disordered mineral metabolism means you can't even detoxify the trace amounts of lead in a garden hose that I drank from, and they have the same biomedical uh, genetic mutations that I have. I detoxified the lead, my youngest couldn't. So, um, and one of the reasons is, is I probably still had some natural ingredients in my body to detoxify, and the ingredients in the vaccines prohibited him from detoxifying from them. So in just some basic nutrients, we start out with the foundation nutrient program, and it gets extremely complicated from there. <laughs> um, but um, even some cod liver oil, which pediatricians used to recommend, um, and there's some very safe 
um, baby probiotics and nutrients, and you can talk to a clinician. But I would I would start there and, and get with a group online um, and with a biomedically trained physician from the Autism Research Institute to help you from there. How do you know when you get a flu shot if there is thimerosal in that vaccine or shot? Rather? Okay. Well, most people would think you just ask your pediatrician or doctor. Um, <laughs> And that may or may not work, but I wouldn't take the risk because we've talked to people who have, you know, talked to their pediatrician, asked specifically for a thimerosal-free flu shot and then didn't receive one to find out later. So what you really need to do if you want to get the flu shot is to ask to see the insert and look for the thimerosal ingredient. Um, that would be the best way. Also, the nasal mist won't have it because it will have the live virus. Um, but you, you have to be your, your own advocate. Over the last 10 years, as an advocate and author in the autism community, do you feel the general public is becoming more interested and open to discussing the correlation between autism and vaccines? That would be a no. Um, <laughs> uh, I have never seen it so hostile in the last couple of months since the measles outbreak, but um, I think it's because Obviously, people are very passionate about this issue on both sides. I want to say emphatically, nobody involved that I've ever met in the last 10 years has ever wanted a resurgence of infectious disease. This isn't about that. This is about whether or not we've been trading infectious disease for chronic disease. And if we're asking the right questions, if we're doing the right study, as Bobby mentioned, if we have the right regulatory agencies in place to be answering these difficult questions. Um, but it's, in terms of the environment right now, um, it's extremely hostile. However, it's also, you know, we talked about this the other day in Indianapolis. Um, I don't encounter personally very many people when I have a conversation with them who won't dialogue with me in a reasonable way. Uh, the internet has made it like a lawless land. People hide behind uh, pseudo names and there's all sorts of people who are paid to actually comment ridiculous amounts of times and dominate the blogs. So I think you have to be able to see through that. Um, but unfortunately, it's not an issue that's going away. Despite how many people want it to go away, it's not going away. This film is going to make sure it doesn't go away. Um, and I actually look, I embrace the controversy right now, the fact that we're even talking about it. In 2007, that was the first time the words vaccine and autism were on television was 2007. That was only eight years ago. And that was like an historic day. I mean, we were jumping around just because they said the words. And now it's everywhere. So I think it just matters how you look at it. But um, but yeah, it's done. Unfortunately, like I said, it's, it's hostile, but, but it's good. It's good because it's on everybody's mind right now. What response have you gotten from the trace, from trace amounts? And how can we support the film? Uh, the response has been absolutely incredible. Um, you know, we have a lot of haters up front because a lot of people group us right into the anti-vaccine crowd and, or call us anti-vaccine. And mostly it's, or all the time, it's the people who haven't seen the film. And I think it's pretty clear when, when watching this film that we have a specific um, objective with, with this film and it's specific to Mercury. And um, so I think a lot of times in fact, we've turned a lot of journalists even. There's a lot of journalists that have interviewed me before, especially the premiere in LA, they, they interviewed me before and I could tell they were completely on the other side. They tell me they were on the other side. And then they watch the film and they completely switch. And we're turning journalist after journalist because you know you almost can't watch this film. You know, these aren't my emails. These aren't tr closed door transcript meetings that, that we created. This isn't, we're not speaking for Bill Thompson. There is a serious problem here that needs to be fixed and they're, you know, they've been misled just like everyone else has, just like we have. And they're understanding that they've been completely misled here. They've been reporting on this from the CDC's documents and, and you know, the powers that be who present the information. And, and they're just as mad as we are that they've been lied to and they're totally turning. And we're doing it one by one, not only with journalists, but uh, senators now as well, because all these bills that are coming up and Bobby's uh, meeting with a lot of legislators who were just down in Springfield yesterday and the response of these senators is unbelievable because you know there's so much misinformation out there and now that they're seeing the information they've never been told before, it's a totally different ball game. And um, 
to make a long answer short, it's it's been a really positive response. We haven't had one negative person yet, so maybe there's one of you that are going to slam us. But um, we did have one person in Seattle that didn't like it very much. But that's before there was a lot of you know the film was even done. We didn't have Bill Thompson in there yet, and uh, it's been 100% positive, except for our hate mail that we get all the time by people who haven't seen the film. Why would the CDC participate in a cover-up under both Republican and Democratic presidents? Um, you know, I, I talked about this, at the, the same question was asked by one of the senators um, that I testified in the hearing that I testified at in Springfield yesterday. And one of the things that I said is that my father had a fascination with how normally decent, kind, civilized people become complicit in great atrocities throughout history. And, um, and, and that's one of the things that's fascinating about reading the Simpsonwood transcript is that you see, you know, when I first called Paul Offit and started talking to him about this issue, he said one of the, something that many of the people at CDC have said to me since is that I got into public service because of your father and, uh, and I love children. And I hear that from people, and of course I'm inclined to like them. So, and I think a lot of these people went to CDC extremely idealistic. And you can watch what happens when you read that Simpsonwood transcript, and they realize that they are caused, that they, these, uh, this time aerosol is causing the autism epidemic, and that they're responsible for it. And a number of them at the outset of the meeting said, we've got to come clean. We've got to tell the American people this is going to hurt, it's going to be painful for us, it's going to be humiliating, embarrassing, it's going to be tragic, but we have to come clean and we have to tell people what we've done, otherwise they're going to lose complete faith in the vaccine program. And we have to get rid of this stuff and we have to go forward with a clean slate and, and, and reconvince them that we can be trusted this time. And then you see these other voices coming in that are saying, well, wait a second, if we release this, the attorneys are gonna come after the vaccine companies and, uh, and there's gonna be litigation and there's a predatory bar and people will stop using vaccines and the institution will be harmed and we need to protect ourselves. And at the end they say, uh, uh, Johnson says, and Ornstein says, we're going to embargo this. Um, uh, the copies of this, uh, of this study, the Restratton study, do not leave the room. Luckily, we have some time to figure out how to react to it. And then the emails start between CDC and the and IOM saying, where can we go in the world where we can show, we can do these kind of uh, epidemiolo epidemiological studies and everybody knows that epidemiological studies that one study that you can cheat on. You know, there's there's a, a uh, there's a old mantra that I know from my profession that statistics don't lie, but statisticians do. <laughs> and you can you can design these studies by excluding certain populations so that you get the result that you want. And that's what they did with these studies. And they did it. You know, I've read tobacco science for my entire career that it and you know, that is done by these hired guns we call by prostitutes who are hired by these companies to you know produce the results that they want and they love epidemiology. So it was very clear to me and this wasn't even very good tobacco science. The, the tricks that they used to skew the studies were you know were amateurish. <laughs> but they were able to take them and then say, look, we proved it, we don't have to do the clinical studies, we don't have to do the pharmacological studies, we don't have to do the toxicological studies, we don't have to do the chemical or biological studies. We've got these six epidemiological studies, and so now we're going to say no more science should be done. They took the vaccine safety database, the one that first Stratton looked at, and all of these questions could be answered in a week if they released the data in the vaccine safety database. You could tell, you could, because you could do studies of what happens to vaccinated versus non-vaccinated populations. And you can look at the different shots and see what the different outcomes were, health outcomes for children. It's all there. If millions and millions and millions of records. 
But they put all of this in a special repository that's outside of the United States government that they pay this company $110 million a year to hold this stuff in a locked box so that nobody can look at it. And the only scientists who have been able to get in there were the Geyers because they got a court order and they got a congressional order that forced CDC to open the vaccine safety database, but they won't give them the data. They actually have to go down into the building and write stuff down by hand. So but they produced, I think, you know, over 20 studies, and the studies are extraordinary. And they, you know, show what we could do if you release this to the public, and it's the reason CDC won't release it. And you know, for journalists to to say to say that that's okay, that you've got all of this data and you won't let people see it, and it's data that we could prove one way or the other immediately whether there's a relationship between autism, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, tics, neurodevelopmental delays, asthma. Um, <coughs> allergies, all of these things that started in 1989, which is the year they changed the, uh, the vaccine protocols. They all changed in that year, and I never knew anybody with asthma or allergies when I was a kid, but today I've got six kids, and in every one of their classes there are kids with asthma, allergy, ADD, all these things like SIDS, which the science scientific data associates with the vaccines, but we don't know because no, but because we aren't allowed to see the data. The American people are not allowed to see the data that we are paying $110 million a year to store in a, in a place that is designed to keep people from looking in there. So, you know, that's a long answer and it's a rambling answer to your question, but, but um, I'm, 